the growth sort of happens slowly. The focus should be on sustaining growth and be more, uh, you know, focused and inclusive about it rather than this idea of constantly trying to hack and, you know, do this short term boost in numbers from various tactics. On today's episode, we are featuring Andre Chavez, who is currently the Chief Growth Officer at Futurum Capital. Andre is also a startup advisor and founding partner of Lemme Growth, a strategic consulting firm focused on developing and accelerating new businesses in the technology, media, and communication sectors. Andre is a columnist for Mayo and Mensagem, and in 2017 co-authored a book titled Restart Me Up which encourages individuals to become the protagonists of their own story. In addition, Andre is also the host and co-founder of the podcast Future Hacker, which was launched in 2020 and is currently present in 85 countries. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the exciting journey of Andre Chavez. How are you, Andre? Fine, and you? Thank you for the invite. <laughs> yeah, of course, no problem. Uh, you're based in Brazil, right? Yes, yeah, I'm based in Brazil, Sao Paulo. Yeah. Uh, how, how's the situation over there? Are things better with coronavirus or? It's a little better, but it's a problem because uh, it's a huge, co- a huge country, né? 200,000 <laughs> million. Uh, uh, so I think it's a, it's a complicated, uh, but uh, now you are uh, evaluating né? in terms of the, the, the the vaccine for, for older people and now uh, in the middle age. So, uh, but we are a, a little late in comparison with the United States, but you yeah. are, you are pursuing our target. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a challenge because, you know, Brazil is a big country, as you said, and so it's never easy trying to get through that many people. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, Brazil will eventually get there. Right, so let's jump into the discussion. Uh, do you remember the moment you realized your passion for growing businesses? Yes, uh, since the beginning of my career, I have always had the thought of growth. Right? But there's no such name, in much less dysfunction. I always thought that between marketing and sales, there's something broader and more connected to strategies, vision of the company and business acceleration. So uh, when I talk about growth, for me, is uh, something transversal, it's not vertical. Growth in terms of business, personal growth, and spiritual growth. So I think this is uh, my point. Yeah, yeah. I think that's such a such an interesting point, right? Because, well, when we think of growth, people just think, you know, more of something and it's just, you know, higher numbers, higher profits and, you know, higher uh, distribution, things like that. But as you said, it needs a more inclusive term than that. It doesn't have to be restricted to pure number or numerical growth. Uh, it could be, you know, spiritual growth, personal growth and, you know, those all things align with, you know, the organizational goals. So I think that's that's good. Uh, now, what are some of the key differences between the way venture capital is approached in Brazil versus the way it is approached in the U.S.? Uh, in Brazil, this market is recent and in a maturing phase. Until two years ago, there is no way out for startups. The funds were very short-term focused on uh, and uh, only focus on company are already operational. In other words, the, the, the funds already started from only from uh, the Series A uh, for, for the ne- and the next steps. Today, uh, this has changed. Uh, veteran developers are an accelerator are already starting to take companies in early stages. And it's already starting to look more like the international mindset market. So I think that's in two years we changed a lot. Uh, 
I, I, I remember when I, I did a, a startup, you know, a, a, some years ago, it's very, very complicated to have uh, funding. To When, when I, I showed one project for one funds, uh, oh, but I'd like to know uh, if you are paid back in a year. <laughs> Crazy. So you don't have mindset of uh, the veteran. And now I think that you are in more maturity phase. Right. Yeah. I think, you know, startups in general are challenging because you have to, uh, you know, take an idea and commercialize it. And you know, that requires a certain level of investment up front, period of time, energy, people, resources. And so when, when investors say that, can you turn a profit into a year? That's, you know, a bit unrealistic because, you know, that's not how it works. And, uh, I'm glad you pointed that out because you know yes. these are these are some of the uh, you know early challenges of developing uh, uh, an investment ecosystem, and India is of course like it has produced more unicorns over recent years, so it has matured in that sense that there is that understanding and uh, mentorship available, uh, but in a lot of other parts, you know, there's still that sense that. Uh, People do not want to uh, invest in high risk projects and they always look for something more conservative. Uh, so it's that. And yeah, I think it's great to see that in two years, Brazil has come a long way and you are able to uh, now, you know, take it to uh, series A level uh, and, you know, move beyond seed stage and accelerators are there. Uh, are the uh, are the investments restricted to particular sectors, or uh, are investors opening up uh, new markets through their investments? I think it's open new marketing for investments. I think it's yes. Okay. So, yeah. uh, I, I I I think that one one thing is very important. Uh, for example, uh, some years ago, when you had. Uh, imagine that you are like to start at one startup here. You have to rent a on place. You have a one secretary. Is <laughs> up to another. You 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 need a month of money to to begin, né? to start your project. Né? Now uh, in co-share né? moments that you are living now is more. I think that. Uh, this moment could uh, accelerate this process of the, the, the number of startups because I think the, the cost of the begin is, is to start is, 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 is absolutely few, uh, little in comparison uh, some years ago. So now you have a more perspective to, 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 to build some companies and not have to all money to, to start. Né? Uh, I think this is a the I think it is a co a combination between the moment the, the the share moment that you are living now and the the the, the maturity of the, the this ecosystem in Brazil in my case yeah, in my country. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's such an important point, right? The barriers to entry once they go down, that's how you know more and more people can jump into the industry and see what they could do differently. And uh, yes, I remember, you know, my uh, father, when he started his company, he had to have a certain amount of money uh, to, you know, have uh, a space, have people, have materials. And that was just to set up a repair shop. Like it wasn't a fancy, you know, dealership or anything. Uh, so that was the startup cost that he had to incur. And of course, you know, by the time I started my company, which is in media, it's like, you know, anybody with a smartphone is a media professional these days. Uh, so, yeah, I think that that certainly, you know, helps a lot to get started. And uh, it's great to see that more and more investments are going into uh, industries that is prompting people to jump into it and, you know, try something new and something different. So I think, yeah, that's that's a great point. Uh, now, you know, given that so much of innovation is driven in the space of emerging technologies these days, such as, you know, blockchain, robotics, AI, 
what approach should traditional businesses employ to secure VC funding, right? Because there are also businesses that are like transportation or, you know, having a supermarket. Is is VC funding a viable option for them in Brazil? Um, the first moment, I'd like to, to, to talk about the traditional companies. Né? I, I think that uh, I'm a big believer in corporate venture movement, right? I don't believe that traditional companies has have to to speed to innovate, disrupt it, and in compete with the thousand of startups that are born every day. I think that uh, this company should foster the acquisition and integration of startups and let them drive the new movements in companies. So uh, I I I. I work with many, many big companies uh, for a long time, it's, it's very, very difficult to have this uh, agility to, to change the things and, and compete with the, the, the uh, how do you say, the movement of startups. So if you can compete, you join. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, this is movement I believe more. The, to, to incorporate startups and, and these startups uh, have a freshness and a mindset and, and, and try to, to, to do this movement for, for the, the sometimes uh, not only to, to survive her, but sometimes to, to have a, a, a money from a VC fund. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, as you said, that traditional businesses uh, don't need that kind of money or, uh, you know, resources to grow on a scale that they could beat uh, other startups or other competitors in their space. And uh, my, uh, you know, they usually grow by acquiring other businesses that are of a similar size and then, you know, expanding their market share that way. Uh, because I think a lot of people don't realize is that when once you have uh, VC funding, then essentially you are on clock, like you know you are on a timeline, on a deadline that you have to deliver a certain uh, you know multiple uh, exit multiple for uh, the investors in a certain time frame, uh, and so that puts a lot of pressure on people to really grow very quickly and make the maximum use of the money. Uh, which might not be an ideal approach for a smaller, you know, family-owned businesses or, you know, smaller businesses that are operating in more traditional uh, uh, sectors. And so, yeah, I think, as you said, you know, if you cannot compete, then you join. I think that's a great strategy. And I think legacy businesses, businesses who are like brick and mortar or mom and pop stores is something that, you know, they could they should consider if the offer is right and things like that. So, yeah, I think... You know, uh, that's a great differentiation between what, you know, funding should be, uh, you know, approached yes. towards. Uh, but uh, I have a one. Uh, I, 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 now I work for one venture developer. It's a similar, it's a little different because, for example, in our case, you, 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 you give uh, funding for, but not traditional, but for startups. And we help the startups uh, uh, given uh, all the strategy to go to marketing, UX, UI, uh, uh, operation, etc. So it's a little different because we, we have, the, we, we, we push the pressure for a startup, but we are uh, with uh, them in the same page. Because we help and, and the, the, the next, for example, when I, I, we support when startup, we not give only money. You, you support in other areas and we are in the, in the same boat. So it's a little different. The, the, the model that uh, startup that, uh, that I'm, I, now I'm working is, is, is a little different because it's not only put the money and in two years after, I'd like to, 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 to know if you achieve the, the, the goals. No. At the moment that you will sign, we, in, in the, the, the next day, we are talking about product. We're talking about strategy for uh, uh, growth marketing. We're talking about UX, UI, uh, and it's, it's a synergy between uh, the startups. 
So it's a little, little difference. It's a similar adventure building or venture development. Right, yeah. I believe this yeah. movement. The founds, the founds has to, to, to more involve it with the, 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 the startups and the strategy for the startups and not uh, check points once per month to understand uh, what, what this is the only strategy. No, I, I believe because 8% of the startups failure because it's bad execution execution yeah so this is a reason why i believe that if you help the startups with execution i, I think that you have a uh, most probability to to well succeed right yeah no that's that's a great point and you know uh that's that's a a more human that's a more uh, you know aligned approach towards building a business and not just you know uh putting in money to simply expect a return and i i think uh, that sort of mentorship that kind of discussions around what the product should be what the strategy should be uh makes a lot of difference uh i, I think because uh you know uh brazil is in that space where you know this is a new sort of emerging wave of how investments are channeled uh, it is easier to do that over there uh, i think in in more con like more advanced ecosystems like let's say us uh there is mentorship yes and you do get management support and there are people helping you out but uh essentially for them it's like okay you know as long as you like their perspective is purely from hitting that milestones because vcs here at least they are in the business of entering and exiting the business uh so they're looking for like the 10 10 times, 30 times, you know, 40 times exit multiple from what they invested. Uh, so uh, because also they have larger portfolio and so not every company that they put in will survive. So they expect that from each company. So that's sometimes it might seem like, you know, a bit cold in that sense that some VCs are just like push you too much to deliver. <laughs> but it's great that you highlighted that, you know, <laughs> execution uh once you focus on execution and work with the team to understand what's the best way to do it that's that's a more you know uh uh that's a more wholesome way to build a business because then they'll survive longer and uh essentially the you won't be uh, trying to beat a deadline to exit in three or five years it's the focus is on building a genuine business uh so yeah i think that's that's great, and I'm glad you highlighted that. Uh, great. Now, uh, you have your own podcast called Future Hacker. Uh, what's the theme of the podcast, and what inspired to have a podcast of your own? Uh, first, I'm talking about the, what the project and what inspired me to build this project. And the, the idea of the future orbits our thoughts and our imagination. A word went home to many people. However, for others, this word seems to be closer. Professionals from the various industries are working, studying, and literally create our future. This is, these are the future hackers, the people that are hands-on now in projects that have big, big impact in the future. Uh, what inspired me? I think that uh, I see a lot of prediction about the future, but I think uh, and prediction, but only about the trends, etc. But uh, I think this is for people, for, for all of them, I think it's most important to, to, to see what what are you doing now. And, and for example, uh, now, uh, Talking, for example, in terms of medicine, you talk about the, the, the drugs for age, uh, blockchain, uh, artificial intelligence, many, many things that you are doing now that have a big, big impact in the, in the future. The second thing is uh, the, the, the knowledge. It's only sector, it's vertical. For example, scientists talk to scientists. Uh, 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 Talk, uh, people that work with uh, human research only talk with the people for human research. I think that you have to put a layer uh, above 
to try to, 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 to build a, a complex uh, debates between areas. I think this is very nice. Not because uh, I, 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 it's a, a, a little no segmentation because you amplify the, 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 the vision when you have a, a, a point of view of different areas. I think this is very nice. To, to not, don't have to, to, to cluster because for me, for me, cluster is a, like a prison. <laughs> <laughs> and when you open your mind for the, for and talking with the, the, the lawyers, the, the, the doctors, engineers, etc. The richness about the facts is bigger. I think this is a, a one point. The the third point uh, about the future hacker, we we not a curatory of news. I'd like to give the information for the audience do the the the, the, the curatory. They know that what believe or don't believe. They know what's the fake news or no fake news, fake science or, or no fake science. So I, 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 I think that the, the, the media, in terms of general, like to, oh no, I'd like to, 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 to give something that is fit for you because I know you. I don't like this kind of approach. I prefer to give empowerment for the audience. The audience have to, 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 to fight with, um, our inner sea to 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 receive the 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 packets uh, the, the the old packets for no 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 I'd like to to give a information and the audience has to 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 see the proposal of value and and understand what the best or not best what I believe and don't believe so I give this empowerment for the audience. And the, 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 the last is uh, international. Uh, I, 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 I think the Brazil, normally, the, the content for Brazil only talk to Brazilians. And the, the, the same excuse, oh no, because Brazil is so big, it's how I'm only talking for Brazilians. And this is a reason why I'd like to, to uh, I, 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 my target is international uh, marketing uh, worldwide. And now you are achieve almost 61 countries. I think it's very nice because you, you, you open the, the, the vision, uh, not only the, 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 the subjects, but in terms of the, the culture for many countries. Yes. Yeah. And I think, you know, you have been successful in doing that because uh, the episodes that I've heard, you know, delve into this fascinating conversation about what future holds for us, but not only understanding that the the guests that you feature also simplified for people uh, who are not from that industry and they want to get a perspective on what does it mean that you know AI uh, is growing or virtual reality is growing or robotics is growing or what is blockchain and what is cryptocurrency things like that uh, so yeah I think you know the ability to condense uh, topics to a simple form is an art in itself. But as you said, you know, it's, it goes much more beyond that. It empowers people to understand the perspective of how the future is evolving and what does that mean for me. So if I'm able to have information and, you know, see the discussions about, okay, this is where the future is going, I can start making better decisions about myself rather than relying on opinions of, you know, what mainstream media says or other people says that you should do this. So I think in that regard, it's great. And uh, I love that you are taking the ideas beyond the borders because we live in a in a global world. So anything that stays, you know, restricted to one region does not get the full benefit of, you know, diversity and, uh, you know, being open and inclusive. So, yeah, I think that's the same reason why I would, you know, have someone, you know, from Brazil come and talk to uh, about their journey on my podcast because I also believe the same that you know people there is talent everywhere there are great ideas everywhere and you cannot compartmentalize by saying that because I'm an Indian I'll do you know podcasts with Indian people or because I'm living in the US I'll only have discussions with people here uh, so that's in part I've you know tried to do it 
you know, in person where I can have people in New York, but then also do it remotely where I can have people from all over the world. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, it's great. And I urge everybody that is listening uh, or watching to this podcast that do check out Future Hacker. It's a great podcast. A lot of fascinating discussions about where we are heading and industry experts talk about uh, their work and how it led to like how it's shaping the industry and making a difference. So please, please check out. Uh, I, I, I did one, and Maria, Maria is a host international, and we did one yeah. experience in Indy. <laughs> we recorded in Indy oh. for, for, for another part of the, the Indians that not talk in English. <laughs> And you, yes. you, and you have a, if you find in Spotify, you find a one recorded in Indy. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah, that never landed up on my radar, but it's exciting that you did an episode in Hindi. Uh, and that, that's true. Like, you know, although India has a lot of English speakers, uh, you know, there's a major chunk of population that does not speak or understand English. Uh, but that does not mean that they're not intelligent or creative. And so, you know, that's a common misconception some people have. But uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for doing that, you know, and uh, embracing my culture and my language and uh, uh, making sure that ideas are not restricted by language and boundaries. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to give that shout out anytime. <laughs> uh, so yeah, thank you so much. Uh, right. Okay, now, so talking a bit more about your role as Chief Growth Officer, what do you think makes a great Chief Growth Officer? What are some of the skills required to be a successful CGO? I think that uh, to be a great CGO, you need to have a broad, innovative strategy vision and methodology to make these thoughts tangible, right? to be able to see beyond and have the persuasive power to get everyone on board engaging this vision. So uh, I think is a, we, we talked in the beginning, I think I have to not focus in only one aspect of the sales, but more, more uh, border in terms of the, 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 the growth, for example, maybe uh, I alliance between two companies uh, you you not only talking about not organic growth, but sometimes inorganic growth. And in terms of the skill of the people, through is a is a is a is a another kind of the, the growth. So I believe that uh, and, and many many companies when you're talking about growth, this 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 position, it's talking only growth hacking, growth hacking, growth hacking, and I think growth hacking is a part of. This, posi this, the, this, uh, this position. I think that, uh, as I, I told in the beginning of the, our podcast, I, I think that you have a many, many aspects of growth. It, it's a similar for me, is a innovation. Innovation, one area for innovation for me does not make sense. I think the all areas has to be a mindset, an innovation mindset, a human resource, and uh, procurement uh, for lawyers, uh, engineers, production, etc. I think that innovation for me is similar in this case than uh, a growth. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's that's very well said, and I agree with you because you know there's sort of this, you know, the new generation of uh, you know business owners that I see, perhaps from my generation, you know, uh, they are so. Uh, you know, focused on just hitting those numbers. So like, okay, we want to, for example, in the world of podcasting, right? They say like, I want to hit a certain number of downloads and then I want to hit a certain number of reach. And once I do that within like two or three years, then I'll be able to like, you know, I'll be acquired by a big company with like millions of dollars. Uh, and while that's not a far-fetched dream, but if you, <laughs> you need you need to have that kind of investment if you want to become like a top podcast in two or three years to the point that it catches the attention of a big company to acquire you. Uh, so it's that. And so you, this idea of like growth hacking or like, you know, somehow you could shortcut your way to growth uh, is a is a problematic uh, approach. I feel that a lot of people, 
you know employ these days uh the growth sort of happens slowly the focus should be on sustaining growth and be more uh you know focused and inclusive about it rather than this idea of constantly trying to hack and you know do this short term boost in numbers from various tactics it's important i mean like you know political developments geographical developments business development sometimes require that you capitalize on those trends uh but when you use only that thing as your approach then you have this like short term boost and you are not really developing a long term you know uh spectrum or an umbrella of growth uh, so it's a very myopic view of growth as you said and uh, yeah you know you hit the nail on the head when you said that it it has to be like innovation it does, it just doesn't happen in one department or one area it has to be an overarching thought process an overarching part of your culture uh, and i just wish that more people saw that because you know i i work with people and helping them develop their podcasts uh, both brands and people and they all fall into this trap of like okay you know if we just keep capitalizing on trends uh, then we will be able to uh, you know gain a lot of viewers but only if you are a journalistic or a, a, a you know news media organization would that make sense for you because then that's your job but if you are a beauty uh, influencer and if you want to cover uh, you know <laughs> current events because you feel that gives you like more <laughs> yeah. downloads then that's a huge disconnect like uh, maybe news from the world of cosmetics and fashion that makes sense but i mean you cannot jump from you know launch of the new iphone to like you know talking about lipsticks and makeup uh, so i mean you can but pe- you will alienate your audience uh, so yeah i think that's that's a great approach that you mentioned and i hope more people understand that and employ that right now okay uh what are some of the challenges that are involved with growing an organization and regardless of the industry you know you spoke about the growth of the people that work with you uh and you know spiritual growth uh how does that factor into trying to take an organization to the next level i believe that uh the company wants to grow has um has to be prepared for this in an in addiction be prepared to fail many times before before get it it right so i think is a uh, change the mindset i know that for example uh, you, uh, you you have a many many idea of, of growth but sometimes some projects failure sometimes so perhaps so the, the the company has to 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 this uh, put in the, the the mindset that fail is part of the game and prepare for the for the growth i think is as true for me is as true man important in this case yeah yeah i think uh, that's another aspect that you know holds people back from really capitalizing on their strengths because you know they see first initial failures and then they just you know give up they feel that okay because you know i'm not able to achieve a certain uh thing i might not be good at it but i mean anyone who begins in anything you know is not good at it first like you know i i come from the finance background so i used to work at an investment bank and now you know i'm working in media so for me when i made the shift it was kind of like okay am i sure i can do media because you know i'm not trained for it uh but because i had people around me who gave me an idea that this is how you should measure success and this is how you should measure failure i was very focused in that sense that okay you know i should focus on developing the skills and doing new ideas and new projects rather than thinking that you know it is some uh you know thing that will work out in couple of years or something so yeah i think you know that's that's a great point and uh you should you should be ready for failures but always aim for like you know bigger higher growth with each project so that's that's pretty cool uh now in your experience as a chief growth officer uh, or in general as a business professional what are some of the unconventional growth strategies you have seen companies employ like when you felt that okay 
that's a rather unique approach to growing a company. Yes. Um, if, for example, in, in the venture builder fund that I work with, for example, we create our own growth methodology, take into account the needs of the startups. It needs to have a method well the the limited phases. If you can find the methodology that fits your company, create your own. So this is a for me is important because uh, you don't have one discipline like we are talking about the growth department, the, the department that you mix the marketing and sales, the, the big big uh, strategy vision. I don't. I don't know if it existed this. So you have to create. And when you create, we need to create the methodology. So, for example, in our case, you have a tree. Uh, the, the, the company that I give uh, the support, uh, uh, the consultant, for example, you have a tree uh, different uh, moments. The first moment uh, to help the, 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 the startups in terms of the strategy, startups, Uh, as we call it, uh, growth camps. And the first moment you scan, seed, what seed? You prepare the, the, the startup to growth. You, you achieve the goals and you have all, all the strategy uh, in the same page. After that, you break it down and try to some strategy for tactical plan. This is uh, the first moment. The second moment, a matchmaking between startups uh, to try to find Uh, synergy between uh, them or co-creation some projects. And the third, as you say, the growth people. You try to give assessment for each moment in the startups. For example, imagine that the startup is a series Z to series B. So they have uh, the, the, the owner, the, the, the entrepreneur, etc. has to, to have a, 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 some skills Uh, to to step to to give the another step in the for the next level. So uh, we we don't have this uh, this methodology in in books. No, you have to create what the best solution. Uh, thinking about the startups, and we only know about this because we are we are in the same boat for the entrepreneurs. So this is a one example for unconventional growth strategy that you are doing now. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's very smart because, you know, uh, generally, uh, you know, a company is a different company when it's a startup and, you know, it, it's a different company when it's in a pre-seed stage or when it's being bootstrapped and then, you know, you receive series A, series B. So with more funding comes, you know, more and more uh, responsibilities and that requires different approach and so it has to be approached in that multi-step manner where uh, each new round of funding or each new stage in company's growth uh, represents a different uh, you know understanding of what growth means and i think this is where you know sometimes uh, a lot of people don't realize that founders uh, might not be able to understand that idea sometimes you know people are great with the technical part so you know if it's a software company for example and there is a founding developer who wrote the initial code and then you know built uh, the prototype and the first uh, iteration of the product uh, with more funding you need someone who is uh, capable of scaling those projects and uh, That's something that a lot of times if somebody came up with the code or the first iteration of the product, they feel that they are the best person to grow this company because they understand the strategic vision and how to scale and all of those things. But, you know, as as company receives more and more funding, uh, it approach changes. And if somebody does not know how to adapt to that, then they might actually be hurtful to the company rather than growing it. So, uh Now I see more and more people, you know, ha understanding that, that, okay, you need sometimes a, a CEO that has been in the business for a long time, longer than them, 
to be able to effectively scale the company and better use the money rather than saying that, hey, because I wrote the code for the first product or the first launch, I should be doing it. Uh, so yeah, it's it's more about like the overall interest of the organization. And that's how, like, you know, as you said that, you know, that's how the strategy is aligned at different stages. So yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. And uh, a lot of people don't uh, understand that, which is sad because a lot of good ideas die that way, but uh, it doesn't have to be that way. So yeah, I think, you know, that's coming up with your own methodology at different stages is a unique approach in itself. Um, so yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, yes, it's a unique uh, way. Because, for example, now you have a 20 startups in different levels, in different uh, products. So, if you don't have the methodology to put uh, a sequence and, and uh, try to think about each one in determined level, the next steps is so difficult to combine this uh, all together. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's that's I agree with you completely on that. Um, so now, of course, uh, you know, you have been in the industry for the long time and grown to the position of chief growth officers, uh, chief growth officer, my bad. Uh, what would your advice be for people uh, looking to become chief growth officers? Um, I think that you have to uh, holistic view of the work you do. Sales is only one growth vector. There are others. Inorganic growth can be a form, another form of growth, new skills and competence. And I don't limit your vision of growth only to sales because it's not sales you can, a joint venture could be growth, uh, alliancing could be a growth, um, co-creation could be a growth, so no, I think it's most important you have a, a holistic view about the the, 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 the company that you are working and not limited growth for sales is I think is a, is a for me is more is most important. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point that you mentioned and people don't realize that strategic alliances and joint ventures are also a form of growing. It's not simply sales. And uh, it's it's overall like, you know, what what is it that takes the company's vision forward uh, in the best manner possible is what I guess, you know, everybody should on the same page with. And that's how you are able to chart the next phase of the growth. And yeah, I think that undue focus on sales sometimes, you know, drives a lot of good people out of the company because then you're putting in so much pressure to hit the numbers every quarter or every year is that they become frustrated that okay we are seen only as a mechanism to gain more money and you know the focus on our career on or our health or our development is secondary in nature and so once that idea creeps into people it's very hard to earn that trust back uh so yeah i think you know, growth is a multidimensional aspect of business and it requires that sort of deep understanding to really uh, make that difference. So, yeah, I think that's great. Uh, now, Brazil and, uh, you know, broadly Latin America is seen as the next frontier for the content creators. Uh, what, according to you, has sparked the rise of content creators in this region? Uh in terms of Brazil, uh, Brazil, we are a creative, innovative people because all the difficult we suffer <laughs> during our lives. We have a broad perception of world and how to fit to fit into it. Uh, however, uh, what we we lack of the boldness to explore new frontiers. Uh, where I said uh, uh, a little time ago. We usually create only for our country. And this way is my first goal with the Create Future Hacker. And we want to speak for the worldwide, not just for two, uh, 200 million uh, inhabitants. Right. So I think the, the, I think this, uh, you are very creative and not you, but uh, we only 
talking with the same people. So you have to 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 to, to amplify our uh, reach. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, what I've seen with Brazil in terms of uh, you know the growth of content is that. Uh, it's, it's gradually sort of picking up pace in the sense that people are now, you know, really talking about their mind and, you know, talking about difficult subjects and sparking conversations that were generally considered, you know, taboo so far. And so uh, I know friend, I have friends from Brazil. Uh, so, you know, filmmakers uh, and journalists and uh, people who work in business over there. And they say that this sort of new infusion of discussion uh, and you know challenging the conventional ideas is emerging slowly as it's happening broadly in that region. So like you know, Colombia has uh, you know a thriving sort of podcast industry now, which it came like you know after the uh, wave of growth in Mexican podcasts. Uh, so it's like they are becoming the means of now discussing difficult things. Uh, both politically uh, and uh, business-wise. And so that is helping people understand the true nature of the situation rather than, you know, taking things as given. Uh, and yeah, I have I have friends uh, uh, in media, uh, in Brazilian media, and they sort of like, you know, discuss these ideas that, okay, uh, it's, it's difficult sometimes to speak up about things that are not popular, but still requires a proper discussion. Uh, and so they are doing that they are sort of you know putting themselves out in the front and saying that okay we want to discuss about this and one of my friends she told me that there's a there's brazilian coca-cola which is a different flavor from mexican <laughs> coca-cola and uh, the one in the us uh, so i was not aware of that uh, you know she just told me that yeah if you go to brazil at some point then you should try out that brazilian coca-cola I'm like Sure. Yeah. Why not? Uh, but <laughs> so it's it's that, and uh, so yeah. I just hope that you know it continues that more and more people jump into this discussion, and as you are doing, sort of you know take this discussion on a global stage and say that okay, we as a nation have these things going for us, and these are our challenges. What could we do to you know emerge from this stronger? Uh, and it's yeah. So I I just hope that you know more and more people sort of jump into that. And uh, since you are doing a, a, a recording in Hindi, I think at some point we should, you know, I don't speak uh, uh, Portuguese, but I have friends. So I might like, you know, have a special episode and do uh, a special edition, a single episode in uh, Portuguese. Uh, th that would be nice. Uh, <laughs> Great. <laughs> So yeah, that will be fun. The challenger. Uh, yeah. I mean, I already have a Spanish version of this podcast. And of course, I don't speak Spanish. I mean, I speak a little bit, but I'm not uh, by any means, you know, good to have that conversation. Uh, so I hired a, a, a native Spanish speaking host and she's from Ecuador and she did every uh, thing in terms of interview. So, yeah, uh, so that that's how we will achieve that. But yeah, I think it will be interesting discussion. Um, and yeah, looking forward to that. So my final question to you is, uh, are there any exciting projects that you're currently working on? And if yes, then what can the listeners and viewers expect from you going ahead? Yes. Um... Now I want you to take Future Hackers headquarters to United States and become a great platform for future studies and debates. On 27 July, we have a big debate to celebrate one year for Future Hacker. And all you and all your audience are invited for this very, very nice discussion. And the, the topic is quantum thinking. Wow. Is a, you have a three big big panels. The first is a mega trends. The second is a future me. Future me is that we are talking about biohacking and neuro and neuroscience, etc. And the last is a technocracy anarchy. <laughs> <laughs> it's very nice topic about what happens with the government, with the blockchain, the, the what the future. Very, very crazy ideas and crazy debates about 
these subjects. So this is a 27 July, and you are absolutely invited for for to join with us. Yeah, that's that's exciting that you know you are jumping into these topics that are the frontiers of technology, and yeah, thank you so much for inviting me and my listeners. So we'll certainly join you and you know uh, support you in your endeavor to bridge the knowledge gap between difficult complex topics and then you know simplifying it for people to understand and uh, yes i'm i'm a big big fan of quantum computing and you know the possibilities it holds for us uh, and more so like you know the thinking behind it of like what's the philosophy and what does that mean for technology and people uh, and our daily routine, uh, our daily life as such. Um, so yeah, I, I certainly would love to be part of that discussion. So yeah, I will tune in and uh, I'll make sure that people have the information to connect uh, once this episode is out. So thank you so much for uh, your time and sharing your experiences and the insights for people to follow. Uh, and I'm glad that we could connect and have this conversation. Perfect. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with your audience. And we are connected. So maybe you can build, as I work with growth, so you can build some together. Yes. <laughs> it's a pleasure yes. for me. Absolutely. Yes. I, I love that. <laughs>